Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Ari, founder of Block Tower, and, and this is really about uh, Nader and, and Basecoin. Uh, so thanks for, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you guys for having me. Honored to be here. So first, an easy question. What inspired you to launch a stablecoin? Yeah, great question, Ari. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it started for me in college in 2012 uh, with Bitcoin, as I think it did for most people. Um, and in particular, there was free electricity on, on, on campus. And let's just say that I responded very aggressively to that incentive. And I built a, like a giant mining rig in my dorm um, and, you know, then got really interested in monetary theory and monetary policy. And so took a couple of courses on that. And there was kind of this aha moment where for the longest time, I was believing Bitcoin to be the next currency. Um, you know, not the next gold, but the next currency. Um, and what I, what I learned, what, what you would learn in a monetary theory class, is that um, basically a fixed supply currency will always be volatile. Um, you know, the value will always be uh, um, fluctuating a fairly high amount. And the reason is that if you have a fixed supply currency, it can't respond to fluctuations in demand without corresponding fluctuations in the value of the unit. Um, and so even if Bitcoin, you know, uh, took over the entire economy, the volatility of the value of each unit would definitely go down, um, but it would probably still be quite high. So just for example, gold, it's been around for thousands of years, still has 15% annual volatility. Um, and so, you know, at first I was like, oh, well, who cares? You know, volatility is fine. Um, but then the next thing you learn is that um, a lot of the most basic financial contracts in our economy don't work unless you have really, you know, very low, like zero levels of volatility. Um, in particular, contracts over time. So if you have a, uh, um, a loan or a salary, for example, if you want to use Bitcoin as the unit of account, so you want to pay someone one Bitcoin per month, even with 15% annual volatility, what happens is the price drifts uh, either against the employer or the employee over time. Um, and so unless you have you know, zero volatility, or more, more particularly, like, unless your currency is hedged against something that is useful, for example, a basket of goods, um, you know, uh, doing these contracts, these financial contracts, are, uh, it, it involves a lot of friction. You basically have to hedge every contract or do something that prevents the volatility from moving against one of the parties. I think there's definitely huge demand for stable coins. Yeah. Uh, I, I certainly agree with that. Yep. So let's jump into the, the stabilization mechanism. Um, yep. So there's a number of competing projects, some of which uh, stabilize with collateralizing US using fiat, like Tether. Um, others yep. will collateralize using cryptocurrency. Your yeah. own project uses um, three separate coins, base coins, base shares, base bonds. Mm -hmm. So maybe tell us um, why that's the best method. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, maybe I'll, I'll, just, I'll just point out the three categories you mentioned. So decentralized, uh, stable, uh, maybe collateralized, decentralized. Um, then I'll call it the, the Tether. Um, and then the you know, non-collateralized, fully decentralized. You know, so we're in that third bucket. Um, and so first, just talking about that bucket, um, I think it's the only bucket that can scale to actually being a, a currency that's on the order of the entire economy. Um, and um, you know, the problem with the, with the other two buckets, so decentralized, collateralized, you know, for example, um, MakerDAO is decentralized, collateralized, and um, the way it works is you basically, you know, it says put in $2 of Ethereum, I'll make you a dollar worth of, of stable coin. Um, and that works because there's two dollars worth of Ethereum backing every stable coin. Um, the issue is, you know, there's basically uh, how many people actually want to lock up Ethereum for a stable coin, right? What is the demand for Ethereum leverage, so to speak? Uh, well, let's just say it's, it's somewhere, you know? Um, the question then is, what's the demand for stable coins? And the answer is it's probably completely unrelated to the demand for Ethereum leverage. And so what you find is a mismatch of demand that means that either the stable coin will depeg upward or, or downward. Uh, that's basically what it means. And so you know, what MakerDAO does to solve this is you know, they apply, they have something called the target rate feedback mechanism. But the point is they apply a haircut to the stable coins that make them, make them less attractive to kind of balance supply and demand and make the, the leverage more attractive. And so you know, that, doesn't, you know, that doesn't really work. Like at a high level, uh, it's bottlenecked by the size of Ethereum. Um, and so I think I haven't seen an approach for the decentralized collateralized that I think really can scale um, and stay stable as it scales. Um, it's kind of like pasting together two different demand functions with, with volatility, which is not, uh, doesn't really work. It's an, it's yeah. an interesting point that if the target is to, to be 
far, far bigger than the existing cryptocurrency world. Oh, yeah. Then yeah. how do you collateralize it with existing cryptocurrency? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and uh, it would be destabilized far before it got to that lot size. But yes, that's, that's a, a higher level existential question. Um, yeah, and then the, the Tether um, you know, uh, equivalents. So Tether is an amazing product. Like People don't understand that this thing is actually being used um, it's the best stablecoin out there. And the team, everything I've heard about them is that they're smart. By the way, the, the MakerDAO team is one of the smartest teams as well. So, you know, we're talking about really good people working on hard problems. Um, so just because I slam an approach doesn't mean I don't, I don't think that I'm not supportive of the team and their efforts. So, but yeah, the Tether, Tether's a great product. Um, its scaling problem is, um, you know, it's basically a pot of dollars underneath a synthetic currency. And when the pot of dollars gets really big, people start asking questions. There's counterparty risk. The pot, are, pot of dollars could get seized. Um, it's owned. You know, it has an owner so that they could modify the database. Um, and so basically, once you have this fully backed system get large enough, people are like, hmm, I don't know. Does this really work? You know, is, is this really trustworthy? And at a high level, you would never, you'd never expect a country, like you never expect the Argentinian economy to base itself on a pot of dollars controlled by a company. People really only trust uh, governments with their currency. Um, and maybe, maybe a big bank could pull off a, some kind of a tether that gets used by the entire world. But again, you also have the problem of like, when it gets to the size of the US dollar market, like what, what's, what's happening, what happens there. Um, so so that's, that doesn't scale for that reason, in my opinion. Um, Basecoin, which you know, kind of pioneered uh, the, you know, uh, to me, it's the first working decentralized, uncollateralized approach. And the cool thing is, you know, um, about Basecoin is there's, there's no collateral. Um, its stability is maintained via incentives. So the, the system basically has baked into it incentives that promote stability. Um, and so people acting based on their profit motive maintain the price of, of, of the currency. Um, and the reason why I'm pretty sure this works is the US system. <laughs> Most monetary systems work like this. Um, the US dollar uh, you know, isn't backed by anything. Uh, it's, it's really backed by an interest rate mechanism um, that essentially creates the incentives to promote stability. Um, and if it weren't for, you know, some potential problems introduced by messing with that mechanism, for example, uh, overprinting for due to perverse incentives and things like that, you, you, and I, in theory, would never have a problem with the incentive-based approach. Um, and so what Basecoin is, it's like, hey, we know this thing works for all the monetary systems around the world, this incentive mechanism. Let's bake it into cryptocurrency and get rid of the owner so you don't have the manipulation issue, you don't have the asset seizure issue, um, and let's make this our new monetary system. Um, so let, let's dive into, yeah. um, let's say that's successful or, or starts being successful. There was just a presentation on Lightning, uh, which is a, a scaling approach yeah. for Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin can handle 14 transactions per second right now, very, very roughly. Um, you know, Ethereum isn't more, even with a sharding, even sharding maybe gives Ethereum 100x. Yep. So uh, to my knowledge, there's no decentralized platform right now that can get anywhere close to, mm -hmm. forget about global usage as currency, but even half of Visa level scaling. Yeah. So how, does, uh, how do people use Basecoins? How does, how does Basecoin achieve? Visa level scaling. Yeah. Um, so before I before I answer that question, a better question is like, do you need that for it to be useful, right? Um, and a great example is like looking at Tether. Tether is built on top of Bitcoin. It has Bitcoin transactions per second, and it's still a tremendously useful product. It has over two billion market cap, a 200x growth rate. Ari, maybe you even use Tether sometimes, right? Do you trade? I don't know if you trade into Tether. We haven't. Okay. But... <laughs> Some people do. Yes. It has value. <laughs> right. Um, and you know they get they do very very well on on Bitcoin transactions per second. Um, Ethereum is an ICO platform, right? Or, like that's one of the big use cases. It does very well on its transactions per second for fundraising. Basecoin is arguably a better fundraising tool because the price stays stable when you actually collect the money. Uh, you know, <laughs> some, anyone who's raised money knows how annoying it is to deal with that volatility. Um, so there's tons of use cases that give you uh, amazing market penetration, and amazing utility before you actually have the TPS to be used to buy coffee. Um, that being said, um, Basecoin is not particularly further ahead than anyone, anyone else in the space. So, you know, we're launching on Ethereum initially, um, and all of us, you know, we have a team of four, you know, four engineers um, plus some, you know, other people, but we all want to write C++. You know, we're all C++ engineers for the last five years, and we're sitting here basically writing JavaScript on Ethereum. Um, so I, no one is itching to work on this problem, like, more than we are right now, but, uh, you know, with Ethereum TPS, we can add tremendous value, and so we're just focusing on that right now. Um, gotcha. Yeah. Is there any, have you, are you guys thinking about or having discussions on um, potentially other platforms or interoperability or... Uh, it, it, is the bet in your mind kind of sharding plasma? Ethereum's going to scale? Yeah, so um, if you ask me, I think sharding is, is going to be the thing that gets us there. 
Um, that being said, if you look at Stellar and, and uh, Ripple, they have like 100 transactions per second already. Now, they make trade-offs to get there. It's not, it's not you know, obviously the way to go. Um, but dude, 100 transactions per second is like a lot. I mean, you know, uh, you know, I was talking to Jed McCaleb, who's the Stellar guy, and I was like, hey man, like, why aren't you doing sharding? You know, whatever. He's like, dude, it's a premature optimization. Like, do you know what to do with 100 transactions per second yet? And it's like, yeah, I guess you have a point. Um, so I would say Stellar and Ripple have already made great progress. And, um, but yeah, I think if you want to get all the way to kind of infinite transactions per second, you have to do sharding. Um, and I think we'll get there. I think mm -hmm. now more than ever, the smartest people are coming into the space. And it's, you know, the derivative is extremely positive. Um, and so I think it's going to accelerate toward, toward that path. Gotcha. Yeah. So another obstacle um, or challenge is regulation. Mm -hmm. Uh, so a lot of countries like South Korea have capital controls. Um, other countries, even ones that don't, have uh, AML, KYC. Yep. So if this is, if, if you have, uh, so, so Basecoin can be pegged to anything. And, and, and if the project's successful, it's very likely to peg to multiple currencies. So why won't the U.S. treat Basecoin USD the same way it treats the U.S. dollar? Why wouldn't AML, KYC apply? And why wouldn't that be true across kind of legal jurisdictions? Or, or and if it is true, how do you deal with that? Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so, um, it's possible that the U.S. will insist that all cryptocurrencies in the country are KYC AML, um, but I, I personally deem that a bit unlikely because it's kind of anti-competitive compared to other countries. Um, that, ju that just means we're all going to use the cryptocurrency from Switzerland or something like that. So yeah, I think there's kind of a tension there. I don't know how it will resolve, but Basecoin will be compliant no matter what. You know, um, we, I think to proliferate, you have to, you have to be compliant. Um, uh, is that it, compliance built into uh, like the, the smart contract itself? Yeah, it would be, yeah. So just as an example, um, suppose that um, the U.S. says, this is just so ridiculous, they're not going to do this, but just imagine <laughs> that every single country in the world got together and said, you're not allowed to use a cryptocurrency unless every address has got, been gotten through like a centralized KYC AML service, right? And every country did this. So they are all consortium agreed, you know, this is how it's going to work. The world currency is going to work like this. We would do that, right? Um, but probably what's going to happen is a country is going to think about doing that, see that no one else is, or like at least a few aren't, and then like, darn it, you know, we're going to be behind, you can't have this. That's my view. You're getting, you're getting like a view, not, not a, f a statement of fact. Sure. Um, but, you know, whatever the consensus becomes, um, you know, it's in Basecoin's interest to, to you know, make sure that, that the powers that be are happy with it, right? Um, but all that being said, to me, the maximum likelihood estimate of where we're going to end up um, is, you know, I think that Bitcoin type pseudo pseudonymous transactions or, uh, you know, are going to, uh, blockchains are going to be widely accepted across the world. Um, and so the only real question is, how does the, the U.S. feel about something competing with the U.S. dollar? Um, and so that's kind of, that to me is the thing that I think about. Um, and to me, I think it's a common misconception that, that Basecoin is competing with the U.S. dollar. The reason being that people in the U.S. and in other countries, or in, in the Eurozone and, and developed countries, they already have a stable currency. In the U.S., they have this thing called the dollar. That's like pretty good. Um, and so the narrative for Basecoin is really, you know, we get, you know, we're built, you know, made in the U.S., but we're not used in the you know, U.S. initially, at least. We're used in developing countries where the most stable currency that these people have access to is devaluing at double-digit double digit percentage rates per year, right? Latin America and Africa. Um, and if you look at what we're actually doing in those countries, these countries want stable currency so badly that they smuggle it across the border, like $10,000 in their, their coat. They take tremendous risk to do this. Then the, the irony is they put it under their mattress to, to store their money, and the police come and take it from them, and they get seized. And it's like, what the hell? This is a disaster. <laughs> and if you think about what Basecoin does for these countries, you can transfer an infinite amount of a dollar equivalent in your head, and it's a stable currency. And you don't keep it under your mattress. You keep it in, in your head or on a piece of paper. No one even knows you have it. Um, and so, so, how are you going to reach those people? So right now, yeah. uh, like a, a sentence I like is that no one owns any cryptocurrency, right? So we, we've, we've been congratulating ourselves, cryptocurrency in 2017, the market yeah. value increased 33x, which is incredible. Still probably less than 75 million people around the entire world use it. Um, so I agree there's huge value. If Basecoin becomes a tether that, that is, is comfortably used for exchange to exchange transfers, for fundraising, tremendous value. Yep. But you're more ambitious than that. Yeah. How do, you how do you go from 75 million to a billion or 5 billion people? Yeah, absolutely. So the first step is a narrative that people understand, which is that this thing can actually scale to being a full monetary system. It will be the first coin that, that has that. Tether doesn't have that. And so the people who want to use a stable currency in other countries, even though they can access Tether, they say, nah, 
nah, you know? Um, so getting that narrative right and getting that narrative understood by everybody is the first step. Um, and, you know, that's an important thing to do right, you know? Um, but uh, aside from that, the as a practical matter, the way that we get in there um, is first through distribution via exchanges. Um, and so we have partnered with like multiple top 10 exchanges um, to, eventually to get listed when we launch. Um, and so uh, that's the first step, that's distribution. Um, getting distribution, uh, uh, once you get that right, then you have to do the messaging, like I said. Um, and so you know, that can be on the ground or it can be via uh, just the media. Um, but another really important touch point is um, large, you could call them centralized points of usage. Um, so for example, um, uh, uh, call them ICO platforms, right? They're all itching to not have to deal with customer support issues about someone getting the wrong Ethereum price, right? Those are just a no-brainer for, for a stablecoin integration. Um, there are cross-border payment, uh, you know, um, uh, 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 companies that, that are partnered with us that currently what they do is they transfer local currency in one country uh, into Bit Bitcoin, they transfer the Bitcoin to another country, they convert the Bitcoin into whatever that local currency is. Got it. So it exchanges clear messaging, clear yeah. use cases for cross-border and kind of yep. expand use cases from there. Yeah. And then centralized BD, you know, gotcha. business development. I'm yeah. getting the hook from our wonderful conference organizers. So yeah. Nader, thank you so much for joining us yeah, and thank you, uh, diving into stablecoin. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.